the word of today, boys and girls, the word of today is magnanimous. Mike Fisher reporting from Frisco, home of your Dallas Cowboys. A little breezy, but sunny. Let's take it. Let's not complain about it. Don't complain about it sounds a little breezy on my audio. Uh, Emmett Smith bobblehead. We're about ready to give that away here to uh, those of you who have decided. I think I'm going to go dip my toe into that premium community. Dollar ninety nine. Hey, uh, costs you one eighth of a cup of coffee. Buys me one eighth of a cup of coffee. Thank you. When you watch Troy Aikman show up at the Jackson State game over the weekend um, to support Jackson State coach Deion Sanders, Coach Dion, like of a real program, not just a high school that he made up. If you don't have the background in it, you're saying, oh, just isn't that nice? It's the old, uh, old cowboy players supporting each other. Isn't that nice? It's more than that. I touched on this the other day before I knew that Aikman was going to show up at the Jackson State game. Um, by the way, toilets frozen in that um, building, in that stadium. No running water. Um, but Dion's Dion. So 10,000 fans showed up to watch Jackson State play. I don't know what the name of the other school was. I never, Edmund Muskie. Edmund Fitzgerald, Edward R. Murrow. I don't know what the other school was called. Something Ed. And they beat him 51 to nothing. And there was the usual Dion drama, because there's just got to be, uh, which we'll get to in a minute. Dion's missing jewelry. But the, the big story was, hey, look how cool this is. Legend supporting legend. Aikman showing up to Dion's game. And it was cool. Uh, and there's video of it. Uh, you can find it uh, at Fish Sports on social media, where where Aikman's hugging Dion. He tells him repeatedly, "I'm proud of you. I love you." It's really, it's really just touching, just by itself. If all you know is the surface, two guys that won a Super Bowl together in 1995, uh, being supportive, but it's so much more than that. This speaks certainly to the drawing power of Dion. And I hope the increased and improved maturity of Dion, uh, I hope that Dion has a better grasp of, of all the things that are at play in the world. Um, besides just the idea that somebody's out to get him, which uh, is something that's kind of haunted him. Certainly he did during his incredible playing career. The best cover cornerback there ever was. Ever. And not even close. The old Aikman story. Have I ever told you this old story? I don't think I have. So the Cowboys, I think, had won a Super Bowl. Maybe maybe they'd won after the first Super Bowl. And the next year, their first game's against the Steelers. And they had Rod Woodson, of course, at cornerback. Future Hall of Famer. A terrific player. And we're at Valley Ranch, and uh, I'm sitting in Aikman's truck, pick em up truck. And we're talking about girls. So this is, uh, this is 1992, 93, so I'm married, he's single, he's dating a country western star, and uh, we're talking about girls. And then I said, oh, by the way, I need to write something. <laughs> I can't, can't, I need to write a story for the newspaper. I can't just sit out here and talk about girls all day. I said, so um, tell me about what you do in your approach against Rod Woodson and the Steelers. And again, I, I hope I have my dates right, that this was the season opener. You guys will tell me if I'm right or wrong in the comments, I'm sure. And Nathan goes, oh, he's great. I said, so do you, do you not throw? I mean, do you avoid throwing over there? Do you? He said, no, never. He said, we don't avoid... I don't avoid, you know, I think our receivers, um, our execution, my arm, my decision making, I don't have to be afraid of any cornerback. Then dramatic pause, except for one. He says, I really don't throw at Dion. 
who I, um, let's see, he might have been, was he still Falcons at that time, getting ready to go to the 49ers. Really don't throw at Dion. He really does take away that, I can't remember if he said third of the field or whatever. He takes away that third of the field. We just, we just don't, we don't go over there when we're playing against Dion. The only guy that Aikman ever played against that we don't, we just, nope, he wins. He's got it. Don't even bother. Obviously, NFC Championship game against the 49ers uh, that next couple of years. You know, I mean, occasionally. But Dion still won, even against Irvin. Even and Armbar cheating a little bit, still won. So Aikman's respect for Dion as a player was immense. And then Jerry cut the deal to bring Dion here. If you can't beat him, get him over here. Let's get Charles Haley over here. Let's get Deion Sanders over here. 49ers, by the way, played the same game. Their deal was, well, let's get uh, Ken Norton over here. Let's get Kevin Gogan over here. It was an arms race between those two great, great teams of the time. So here comes Dion, And this had changed to some degree under Barry Switzer in 1994. And Aikman walks out to the very first practice, and there's music playing. And it didn't matter that his, it wasn't his particular favorite kind of music. That wasn't the point. His, what, 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 what's, this, what's, what's this noise? This isn't how we practice. Well, Switzer had decided to allow the fellas to do what the fellas did at Oklahoma. You want to bring music? I don't care. Everybody can bring music. Doesn't make any difference to me. Switzer didn't care. Switzer's policy, of course, uh, famously, was I, I treat these guys like men. They're 27-year-old men who've won a Super Bowl or two. I'm not, I don't need to tell them what music to listen to or even not to listen to it at all. Aikman did not get that at all. That was the very first workout, very first Switzer-Aikman workout in 94. It, it wasn't a racial thing. It was, why are we doing anything different no, hey, Barry, who Aikman, of course, had known for a long time. We need to do things exactly like we've been doing them. Don't change anything. Don't change it for the better. Don't change it for the worse. Don't change it up. Don't change it down. Don't add music to the practices. We've never had music for the practices, and we just won two Super Bowls. We get to the 95 season, and, of course, Switzer's still here, and now Dion's here. And... To say that Dion was a distraction would be to put it mildly. Still, still brilliant, but you know, Dion was Dion was like the first guy in pro sports to talk about money. He just talk talk so openly about money, about how much he cared about it. And again, in reality, so do most of the rest of us. And so, so maybe we can say that he was a pioneer in that regard. But it was it was uh, distracting to guys that weren't used to it and upsetting to guys that weren't used to it. That was okay. However, when Dion decided to make the observation, first a private one, that in Cowboys practices and games, Aikman, who happens to be white, yells at the black guys more than he yells at the white guys. That was Dion's accusation. Not very coded language, not very veiled. You could see exactly what Dion was trying to insinuate. And Aikman found himself having to, to defend himself in his own locker room that he and Michael Irvin and a couple other team leaders, most of them, by the way, African-American, ran. And Aikman obviously was a part of the leadership group, naturally. He had found himself having to defend himself against this, this ridiculous accusation that he was yelling at the black guys. And I remember talking to some of them who vehemently disagreed with Dion, saying, now wait a minute, and, and I think Irvin did actually help me write this. He goes, fish. He goes, and again, I'll, I'll, I can't do all this off the top of my head, but you know, we've got four running backs. We've got four guys in the running back meeting room. One of them's white, Daryl Johnston. 
So 75% of our running backs are black. Our tight ends, we got three tight ends. Uh, one of them was Novacek. I don't remember if Alfredo Roberts was here, whatever. You know, we got three tight ends, 66% of them are black. We got five wide receivers, 100% of them are black. We got 10 offensive linemen, 70% of them are black, whatever the numbers are. Fish, Aikman, uh, Irvin tells me, and other guys too. I think, I think uh, Kelvin Martin might have been involved in this conversation and Kevin Williams. And I'm like, Fish, you need to explain to the audience before they get it all twisted. The reason that Aikman yells more at the black guys than he does the white guys is because there's more black guys to yell at. Which white wide receiver do you want him to yell at because he ran the wrong route? Now, we can also add, frankly, um, who do you think ran the better route more often? Novacek or Kevin Williams? Nothing against Kevin Williams, but Novacek is like the greatest tight end route runner of, of his time. So it, it, was, it was a terribly destructive thing for Dion to do. And what happened inside the building is he recruited John Blake, late John Blake, I believe, now, who had been the head coach for a minute at Oklahoma and then rejoined Switzer here. So he was, when Switzer was looking for a right-hand man, actually John Blake was here before Switzer. So Switzer was looking for a right-hand man he could trust and he relied on John Blake. They're very close. Well, John Blake decides to take Dion's side in this. Now poor Switzer, who I adore, as you know, finds himself in the middle. I got my quarterback and, and his supporters are saying, no, no, Barry. But I got John Blake, my most trusted assistant, saying, oh, Barry, dion has got something. What a mess. The fact that that team won the Super Bowl after the 1995 season, because when that was going on, not to mention other stuff, but that one, is one of the reasons this is the greatest football team ever assembled, that they could overcome that. And now here we are 25 years later. And Troy Aikman is magnanimous. Obviously, Aikman and Dion have way since made up. It's not like Aikman went to the Jackson State game just to fix that problem from 25 years ago. It's fixed. No big deal. I, I, don't, I don't know that anybody even much knows about it, except now you do. But when I saw Aikman walk onto that field, I didn't think, oh, this is great. A couple of old cowboy best friends. I thought, man, I want Aikman on my side. Dion, after the game, which Jackson State won, would hold a press conference in which he made the main issue, the fact that somebody had burglarized the locker room and stolen his jewelry box. And then it turns out that's not exactly what happened. Something happened, but not exactly that, and Dion's got his jewelry. He's one of a kind, that Dion. If I wasn't mistaken, he's wearing a letter jacket looking thing, except it doesn't say JS on it for Jackson State. I could swear, tell me if I'm wrong. I could swear it said DS. Does it? Did it? DS. Deion Sanders? Does he have a Deion Sanders letter jacket or did I just meet, misread the lettering? I'm, I'm so glad that Dion is doing that because it's, uh, it's, a, it's a generous thing for him to do and a learning experience for Coach Dion. Dion's one of a kind in so many ways. But Troy Aikman, forgiving that? Our man Troy Aikman, one of a kind. Fish out.